This is the My Dark Path podcast. When I visited Velisca last year, my original intent was simply to see the location of the Velisca axe murders. The infamous slaughter occurred in a home just a few blocks from the center of this beautiful farming community. And today, the house remains intact, preserved to allow visitors to experience what the home would have looked like and been like on the evening of Sunday, June 9th, 1912. This was the night when a man murdered the entire Moore family, plus two girls, friends of the Moore's daughter. After visiting the home, I walked around the neighborhood, pondering the evil that lurked in the heart of the man who was responsible for the deaths of these eight people and what had become of him. The intensity of the horror of that night is only matched by the absurdity of the investigation that ultimately tried several suspects, but none were found guilty. But just days before arriving in Velisca, I read a book called The Man from the Train, which completely changed my perspective on the crime. The author, Bill James, suggests that the same person committed a series of axe murders between 1898 and 1912 across the United States, including the infamous 1912 Velisca axe murders in Iowa. And that this unidentified serial killer traveled by train to perform these heinous acts. And if true, this serial killer is responsible for at least 59 deaths, with the potential to have committed up to nearly 100. The theory hinges on a pattern of behaviors and circumstances. The murders typically were carried out with the blunt end of an axe belonging to the victim. The majority of them took place near a train track. The killings were all done at night, and the victims were often, or almost always, asleep in their beds. The Velisca axe murders are the most notorious of these cases. However, with the passage of over a century, definitive answers are likely out of reach and the true identity of the man from the train remains a subject of speculation. So I walked the short half mile between the train tracks and the Moore's home, just six blocks directly north of the train tracks. And as I walked, I pondered the extent of this serial killer's crimes that not only extended across a decade or more, but potentially across continents as well. And in this episode of My Dark Path, I'll share some of the other poignant stories of the victims of the man from the train and one of the fascinating hypotheses about who he might have been. Hi, this is MF Thomas, and this is the My Dark Path podcast. Every episode explores the fringes of history, science, and the paranormal. So if you geek out over these subjects, you're among friends here. See our videos on YouTube, visit MyDarkPath.com, or find us on X, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you like My Dark Path, please consider signing up for My Dark Path Plus on Patreon. Subscribers get exclusive episodes and free swag like t-shirts, stickers, and books. Find us there at patreon.com slash mydarkpath. I'm grateful for all of our subscribers there. They make it possible for me to hire more researchers and writers to expand the team working on this great podcast and YouTube channel. Your support humbles me. But no matter how you choose to connect with me in my dark path, thank you for listening and choosing to walk the dark paths of the world with me. And if you're interested in the details of the Velisca axe murders, which I won't cover here, you can listen to the entire episode in Season 3, Episode 50 of My Dark Path. Let's get started with Episode 57, The Man from the Train. Part 1 Now, I don't usually go out of my way to visit crime scenes or gawk at the misfortunes of others, but the proximity of Colorado Springs made the opportunity too easy to pass up. The homes at 743 Harrison Place and 321 West Dale Street are just west of downtown Colorado Springs, and they're now demolished and other homes have replaced them. So, unlike Vasilla, there is nothing to see of the location where a horrible series of events took place in September of 1911. 
Yet the act of standing in the location where the homes once stood left me sorrowful for the people whose lives were cut short by this killer. The Wayne family had migrated to the growing town of Colorado Springs just weeks before their deaths. The 1910 census put the population of the town at about 29,000 people. The Wayne's new home lay beneath the endless blue skies and against the backdrop of the Rockies. Henry Wayne, his beloved wife Blanche, and their one-year-old daughter Lulu May had moved there so that Henry could rest and hopefully recover from his diagnosis of tuberculosis. A fraternal organization, the Modern Woodsmen of America, had opened a sanitarium in the small town as the air there was crisp and healing. Tuberculosis is an infectious disease that mainly affects the lungs. The bacteria that cause tuberculosis are spread from one person to another through tiny droplets released into the air via coughs and sneezes. The first breakthrough in the treatment of tuberculosis came in 1943 with the development of the antibiotic streptomycin. But before that time, the best treatment option was to send TB patients to sanatoriums. These were facilities where patients could get plenty of rest, fresh air, and good nutrition, which were believed to be beneficial in combating the disease. The theory was that a healthier, dry environment would boost the patient's immune system. Scattered around the sanatorium were cottages, modest two-room homes where the patient's families could stay. Patients were permitted to visit their families on days when a measure of vigor returned to their bodies. And so the Wayne family moved into one such vacant cottage, hopeful Henry would fully recover. Their landlord was Arthur Burnham, who lived next door with his family, his wife, Alice May, and their children, Nellie and John. And so it was that families would arrive in Colorado Springs expecting to return to health and normalcy. But for the Wayne and Burnham families, the night of September 21st, 1911, would end in terror. Six individuals across the two families were brutally murdered in their homes. Mrs. Nettie Rush and Miss Anna Merritt, relatives of Alice Burnham, made the first gruesome discovery the following afternoon. They came by the house to visit Alice and the children, and as they opened the back door, they were nearly overcome by a foul stench coming from the home. Without a response to their knocking, the two women first struggled to unlock the residence's rear door before finally getting it open and stepping inside. There, they saw the remnants of Sunday evening supper on a table in the small rear room that served as a kitchen, dining room, and bedroom. Mrs. Ruth noted that it was unchanged from her visit on Sunday night around 9.15 p.m. The bed in this room was untouched. Then, still seeking the source of the smell, they opened the door to the front bedroom. They braced for a grim discovery. A pile of bedclothes on the mattress initially masked the tragic sight. But soon, Mrs. Ruth noticed bloodstains on the wall and the body of her young niece with a crushed skull lying at the bed's edge. Overwhelmed and horrified, the women fled the house screaming and found two men passing on the street. Quickly, the men entered the house while the women waited outside. And shortly, the Good Samaritans reemerged, confirming the triple murder. News of the tragedy spread rapidly. Authorities, including a coroner, police, and sheriff, were alerted and soon arrived on the scene. But as the crowd of authorities and bystanders grew, many started to observe that no one had been around the Wayne house, which was just a few steps away from the Burnhams, since the previous day. The assistant police chief and other officers forced entry into the oddly quiet house where they found the Wayne family, husband, wife, and baby, all dead in their bed, their skulls brutally crushed, just like the Burnhams had been. A bloodstained ax borrowed by Wayne to chop wood was found at the back door, linking the two crime scenes. With the discovery of the second murder scene, the crowd outside roiled with shock, anger, and grief, and many started calling for the lynching of the unknown perpetrator. Inside both homes, authorities searched for clues and motives. The lack of robbery as a motive was very evident, as Mrs. Wayne's jewelry and a gold watch in the Burnham home were untouched. The method of entry and exit for the murderer was apparently through windows in both homes, 
the doors were locked and both. At the Burnham home, a window on the east side was at the entry point, as indicated by an overturned ink bottle on the sill. The search for the murderer quickly focused on Albert Burnham. As the only survivor of both families, everyone started looking for him. Deputies started to drive to the sanatorium where he worked as a yardman. The sanatorium was about 12 miles away, and when they found him, he was already on his way back to town, riding in the back of a wagon. Someone had called the sanatorium and told him about the murders via telephone. And when the deputies found him that afternoon, he said, quote, My God, how did it happen? Did they get killed in a railroad accident? End quote. By 3 p.m., the deputies arrived with Burnham at the crime scene. They took him inside his home to see where his wife and children had been slaughtered. Everyone present, from the police to reporters, expected Burnham to break down at the sight of the murder of his whole family. Instead, he was perhaps the least affected by the scene of anyone in the home. Reportedly, he didn't cry or flinch. Instead, he moved randomly around the room, muttering, quote, It's terrible, it's terrible, end quote. He also noted, as he inspected the bedroom, quote, Nothing's torn up around here, end quote. Everyone was astonished by his calm demeanor, and as they left the home to show him his neighbor's home, he paused at the kitchen stove and he pointed to a pile of ashes in front of it and asked, quote, How did that get there? End quote. The deputies didn't know, but they walked next door to the Wayne home, and again Burnham showed virtually no response, even when the axe, the bloody murder weapon, was pointed out. The deputies left the homes, taking Burnham directly to the morgue so that he could see his family. His numb response continued as he saw his family, and he said, quote, That isn't my little child. My girl's got lighter hair than that, end quote. Perhaps he was in shock as slowly he came to recognize his daughter. And then, when shown his wife's body, he did not comment. But while there, he told the deputies, quote, Don't waste time with me, but get busy with someone else. Whoever did this must have been an enemy of hers. It couldn't have been of mine, end quote. And after viewing the bodies, the deputies told him that he'd be detained for further investigation. And they arrived at the county jail about 5 p.m., the crime scene at the Burnhams was horrific. Alice and John had been killed while sleeping, a blunt side of an axe crushing their skulls. Nellie, the six-year-old girl, had either been awakened by the attack or been moved and positioned after death. She was not found in her bed. The chief investigator would later observe that something in the room made him describe the killer as a moral pervert. The exact description or reason for this was never noted, but unfortunately, we do know what that meant. Like the Velisca murders of 1912, evidence of the killer's moral perversion was coupled with other telltale signs. The house was locked up. The blinds were closed. The murderer had left a bowl of bloody water where he likely washed his hands. And remember that bottle of ink on the windowsill that the killer had knocked over? Well, not only did the killer leave his smudged prints on the windowsill, but he also left a clear thumbprint on the axe handle. Albert's observation about the pile of ashes outside the stove also highlighted a clue. Officers found part of Sunday's newspaper crumpled and partially burned in the Burnham's home. Above the newspaper, part of a curtain window was scorched, leading to the suspicion that the murderer had tried to set fire to the home. There is some question about whether this burned curtain was the work of the killer or not. Reportedly, a news photographer later said that he'd used too much flash powder, but still, author Bill James believes the killer did attempt to burn the house, as this was something the killer often did. Police worked quickly to try to tie Albert to the murders while he was in custody. Burnham's movements and whereabouts during the time of the murders were scrutinized. But colleagues from the sanatorium, where he worked, provided alibis, claiming he was present at work. And Dr. Rutledge, superintendent of the sanatorium, stood firmly by Burnham's innocence, citing both his physical condition and the logistical improbability of him committing the crimes. In addition to his alibi, Albert was simply too sick with tuberculosis to have committed the murders. And sadly, he would die of the disease just a few months after his family's death. The Pinkerton Agency in Denver was hired to investigate, and the police chief in nearby Denver also contributed resources. 
The agent in charge from Pinkerton, Mr. Prettyman, was confident that they would quickly uncover the killer. He said, quote, No person can commit a crime of this kind without leaving some sort of clue. And once we find the clue, the whole story will unravel like a ball of twine and with the rapidity that will surprise the men working on the case. It may take a day, it may take several weeks, but sooner or later we will be in a position to announce that we have a footing. And from then on, it will be easy sailing. End quote. With Albert cleared, the investigators turned to other suspects. Apparently, despite their small home, the Burnhams would rent out the spare bedroom to people who couldn't get a room at the nearby boarding house. Sometimes they would even allow a boarder to sleep on a hammock on the porch. So all these past boarders now had to be investigated, in addition to transients in the area. Alice Burnham reportedly had a difficult relationship with an ex-boyfriend who lived nearby. But after investigating all of these individuals, no case could ever be brought forward. And no one was ever charged for the crime. But one thing was certain, Mr. Prettyman of the Pinkerton Agency, as well as the police, definitively scorned the idea that the killings were the result of a lunatic who had no connection to either family. And if it were the man from the train, he might have been watching the children play outside and case the house over the afternoon, the day of the murder. Author Bill James believes that he may have been focused on Nellie Burnham, then broke into the wrong house and killed the Wayne family by mistake. But then, realizing his error, he broke into the Burnham house and completed his mission. Sometimes, the history of these axe murders, like those in Colorado Springs and Vasilla, can be mixed up with the case of the New Orleans axemen. There were many attacks in New Orleans area, starting with the murder of August Crudy on August 14th of 1910, and then continuing in 1911 and 1912. Then the New Orleans Axeman took a break before resuming his terror in 1918 and 1919. And while there are many similarities, the details of the crime clearly show the crimes to be of different perpetrators. Both killers attacked in the middle of the night using axes taken from the homes of their victims and then were left there. Superficially sure, these similarities might make one think that they were the same person. Still, the man from the train almost always attacked within an hour of midnight and the New Orleans axeman struck between 3 and 4 a.m. The man from the train used a heavy axe suitable for logging or chopping firewood, and he always used the blunt side of the axe. The New Orleans axeman used small axes like a meat cleaver and used the sharp edge of it for his atrocities. Also, the New Orleans axeman primarily attacked adults and often ignored children. The man from the train killed everyone in the home, but as I've described, had a predilection for preteen females. The New Orleans axemen stayed in the confines of the city while the man from the train only killed in small communities and virtually all within a short walk of a railroad line. Part two. While I shared the details of the sorrowful destruction of these two families in Colorado Springs, they unfortunately represent just two of 25 family killings that are attributed to the man on the train between the years 1900 and 1912. The first of these occurred in 1900 in Trenton Corners, New Jersey, when the Van Luis family of two were murdered, and the last was the murder of the Fanschmidt family in 1912 in Payson, Illinois. And despite 12 years between these 25 family annihilations, all of them had almost identical characteristics. The blunt side of an axe was used, the axe belonged to the victims and was left at or near the crime scene after the murders. The murders occurred late at night when everyone in the house was sleeping. A young girl was among the victims, and this serial killer seemed to have a fixation on young girls. Oftentimes, the body of the young girl was the only one that the killer seemed to pay attention to and was posed post-mortem. It is also hinted at in several cases that the killer performed a sexual act over the dead body of a young girl. And the mirrors in the homes were covered in cloth and the heads of the victims were covered with a blanket. The crimes took place in rural areas or small towns. 
Close proximity to the railroad tracks, typically within a quarter of a mile, and in many cases the location was near the intersection of two railroad lines. And the murderer either set fire to the house, locked it up tight, or jammed the doors before leaving. The killer left a lamp burning without its glass chimney at the crime scene, and nothing was stolen despite valuables being left out in plain sight. And the last murder, attributed to the man on the train in Illinois in 1912, reflects these common characteristics. In the serene farmlands near Payson, Illinois, east of Quincy, a horrible crime unfolded in the early hours of September 29, 1912. This event would shock not only the local community, but send ripples of horror throughout the Midwest as some, by this time, had begun to recognize the pattern that the man from the train deployed. The timing of this tragedy was particularly unsettling, coming just months after the infamous Moore family murders in Villisca, which had already instilled fear and uncertainty in the region. Villisca and Payson are only about 300 miles apart via road or railway. Newspapers reported that the police thought it to be the work of the, quote, degenerate who had perpetrated similar axe murders in Iowa and Colorado recently, end quote. The chilling discovery was made on the morning of September 30th. The Fanschmidt household, a modest home just outside Payson, was engulfed in flames, revealing a gruesome scene. The victims were Charles Fanschmidt, 46, his wife Matilda, their 15-year-old daughter Blanche, and a young school teacher named Emma Capium, who had boarded with them. Initial investigations suggested the killings occurred on Friday night, with the fire set later to obliterate the evidence. Isolation of the house was ensured by severed telephone lines. The grim scene was first noticed by neighbors who saw smoke rising early Sunday. Firefighters arrived to witness a fierce blaze that nearly destroyed the house, and when the metal roof was finally removed and the investigators could enter, a horrifying sight awaited. The bodies of three women, Matilda, Blanche, and Emma, were discovered upstairs, brutally bludgeoned with an axe, and down in the cellar amid the charred remains lay another body, barely recognizable and extensively dismembered, later identified as Charles Fanschmidt. Also near the body of Charles, in the cellar was an axe head with human blood baked on it from the heat of the fire. The axe handle had been burned away in the fire. In the aftermath, a massive manhunt ensued. Police, deputies, and armed locals scoured the area aided by bloodhounds. The focus was on a suspect believed to have arrived by buggy shortly before the fire. The crime bore eerie similarities to the recent axe murders in Iowa and Colorado, which drew the attention of the Iowa Attorney General and leading to the involvement of the Burns Detective Agency. The Burns Agency set C.W. Toby, one of the detectives who had spent a few weeks working on the Velisca case. Suspicion quickly fell on Ray Fanschmidt, the 20-year-old son of the deceased couple. Ray had recently moved out to work on a railroad project living in a tent near the site. The evidence against him was tenuous. There was a set of buggy tracks and bloodstained clothing possibly belonging to him was discovered under an outhouse by J.L. Fries, a local resident. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, though, the police arrested Ray, driven by the era's less rigorous standards of proof and a pressing need for closure. Further investigations revealed potential motives. Charles Fanschmidt, a substantial landowner, had been frustrated with his son's financial irresponsibility, documented through bank notices of overdrawn accounts. And with the parents' death, Ray stood to inherit a significant fortune, providing him with a conceivable motive. Detective C.W. Toby from the Burns Agency was brought in to explore connections between this case and the other Midwestern axe murders. Ray, once in jail, enlisted Toby's expertise to propose an alternative theory, that a roving axe murderer was responsible for similar crimes across the region and that this was the culprit in his family's deaths. This strategy aimed to introduce reasonable doubt in Ray's defense. The trial, held in March of 1913, focused solely on the murder of Blanche, a common tactic in multi-victim cases to circumvent double jeopardy. Despite the circumstantial nature of the evidence, the prevailing public opinion was against Ray, who viewed him as irresponsible, 
and this led to his conviction and death sentence. The trial was marred by emotional testimonies, including from Ray's own grandfather, who spoke of his grandson's constant demands for money. Ray's lawyers appealed, arguing that their original change of venue request should have been granted as the passions against their client burned hot. And in February of 1914, Ray was granted a new trial by the Illinois Supreme Court. And then he was found not guilty for the murder of his sister. Then he was put on trial for the murder of his father and found not guilty. Then the state dismissed the case of murder for his mother. These events convinced many in the area that Ray had evaded justice for the murders and that the Burns detective, C.W. Toby, had played a pivotal role in this. At one point, Toby was simultaneously receiving compensation from both the state of Iowa and Ray, the very subject of his investigation. This posed a potential ethical conflict. However, if there had been any tangible link between the Illinois and Iowa cases, Toby would likely have pursued it. The reward for solving the Velisca murders was a significant incentive, as both Toby and the Burns Agency stood to gain financially from resolving the case. Ultimately, Ray Fanschmidt collected his inheritance and left the area. And at least according to Bill James and his research, this was the last case in the U.S. involving the man from the train. But to tell the story of the last case, we have to look at the very first murder that involved the man from the train and identify who he could have been. And for that, we jump to the last decade of the ninth century to the year 1898 and the town of Worcester, Massachusetts. Part three. About 30 miles north of Worcester lies Coquinquazet Pond. In the late 1800s, this location featured a resort complete with stables, boats, a picnic area, a dance hall, and a small hotel. It was early in the summer of 1897 when a man in his mid-30s arrived at the Point of Pines Resort, penniless and seeking employment. Captain H.D. Hodgson, who managed the resort, offered Mueller accommodation in exchange for his carpentry and repair work. The man introduced himself as Paul Mueller and claimed that he was a German military veteran. He was short but muscular. His English was poor. People noted that his teeth were small and widely spaced. He was only about 5'5 in height and weighed perhaps 155 pounds. He had long, greasy hair and a poorly trimmed beard and mustache. Newspapers investigating Mueller later on would also note that he was, in fact, left-handed. A fact, if you recall, that was relevant to many of the axe murder cases. Additional observations noted that he had small feet, about size 6, and a scar from his wrist to his little finger, and another scar above his right eye, and a distinctive walk. Despite this off-putting appearance, Hodgson offered in exchange room and board for his skills in carpentry and Hodgson, who operated the resort on very limited funds, accepted. Overall, Mueller had a very off-putting appearance, but Hodgson, very short on funds, found the agreement to be cost-effective. And when Mueller arrived and settled down, the resort was tending to a horse thought to have a broken leg. In that era, and often still today, a horse with a broken leg would typically be euthanized due to the implications of such an injury. But in a remarkable turn of events, Mueller saved the horse from death by crafting a leg brace for the animal. The community was amazed, and Mueller attributed this skill to his experience in the German army. Later, newspaper articles about Mueller would recount some of his other characteristics. He was reported to be an efficient woodchopper and an efficient worker. The summer and early fall passed with Mueller happily working at the resort. But in October of 1897, a conflict arose between Mueller and Hodgson. They were hauling a load of wood when a disagreement escalated during their trip back to the resort. Still, about three miles from their destination, the argument crescendoed until Mueller could stand it no more and jump from the wagon right in front of a farmhouse. Hodgson continued on, but Mueller approached the farmhouse and asked the owner for a job. The home and farm were owned by Francis Newton, 
Francis was not a native to the area. He was born in 1853 in New Braintree and then moved to Brookfield as a young man. Initially, he ran a milk route and then later operated a bakery near Hartford, Connecticut, about 50 miles south. He married a woman named Sarah, and in around 1888, they adopted a baby girl from Sweden, naming her Ethel but calling her Elsie. The family resided in Hartford while Newton managed the West Side Bakery. In 1896, they relocated to a secluded, rundown house on a back road between Brookfield and Sturbridge, known locally as the Sturbridge Road. Despite being middle-aged when he purchased the farm, Francis diligently worked to improve the barn and the house, transforming it into a respectable home. So, while he was hardworking and prosperous, he certainly wasn't wealthy. But like all farms, Newton needed help, and no doubt, Mueller's odd introduction would have given him pause. Yet, given the size of the community, it was likely Newton had heard of Mueller's heroics that saved the horse from death. But whatever it was that prompted Newton to offer Mueller employment, we don't know. But they agreed to an employment contract and Mueller immediately moved into the home, sleeping in a bedroom right next door to his employers. Reportedly, Newton was happy with Mueller's work. Newton's brother-in-law would later describe Mueller as being efficient and agreeable, but cranky at times. Others who knew him called him sullen. Newton, for his part, was not prone to winning over people either. He had a stern demeanor and was known for being harsh with his hired help, demanding and strict. Newton reportedly made it clear to Mueller that subpar work would not be tolerated. In addition to his routine work, Mueller applied his carpentry skills, building a horse-drawn sleigh that could be used for hauling heavy loads in the winter. And so, four months passed with Mueller working for and living with the Newton family. That is, until early January of 1898. On the chilly Sunday afternoon of January 9, 1898, an incessant barking echoed from inside the Newton residence. Francis Newton had been conspicuously absent since the previous Friday around 5 p.m., Joseph Upham, a neighbor, was the last to see him while visiting to collect a debt of a single dollar. Of course, that seems to be irrelevant, but that was the equivalent of about $300 of wages earned today, so not so inconsequential. Upham remembered a warm, cheerful scene during his visit, Newton's young daughter Elsie and her mother Sarah contentedly playing on the floor. The visit was cordial as well, with Francis showing Upham some new farm equipment he had in the barn. Upham observed their farmhand Paul Mueller working in the barn as well. Nothing seemed to miss between Newton and Mueller at the time. However, by Sunday, a sense of unease had settled over the farm. Newton's 15 cows moaned, burdened with milk and unfed for two days. Elmer Newcomb, residing a quarter of a mile away and the closest neighbor, noticed the unusual neglect. Newton, known for his business acumen and careful handling of his farm, wouldn't just overlook his responsibilities to his farm animals. Prompted by concern, Elmer, along with other neighbors, William Bemis and William Eaton, they all went over to tend to the neglected cattle. They speculated that the Newtons might have left for the weekend unexpectedly, though it was strange that they hadn't arranged for the care of their livestock. And after tending to the cows, the men refrained from prying further and left. But off the property, the group indulged in further speculative discussions. Perhaps Newton's relative success and somewhat distant demeanor sparked some envy among his neighbors. However, after some deliberation, they all agreed the situation was peculiar, and particularly the lack of arrangements for the cattle. So Eaton was particularly insistent that they make a follow-up visit. The men were hesitant to intrude on their neighbor's privacy, but they all felt uneasy. Farmers don't have the luxury of just disappearing. So Elmer, Eaton, and three more neighbors formed a party to investigate. Only Bemis declined to join them. They approached Newton's two-story white farmhouse around 10 p.m. that night. Finding both front and back doors locked and the curtains drawn, Their knocks, calls, and attempts to force the door were only answered by the continuous barking of the dog. The entire scene increased their discomfort as they lingered on their wraparound porch. Finally, one broke a window pane that allowed them to enter the house, the window opening out into the parlor. 
Another member of a party found and lit a lamp, and then the men cautiously proceeded to the first bedroom on the main floor, located in the central section of the house. There, they discovered both mother and daughter in their beds, submerged in blood, with covers heaped over their heads. Both had gruesome injuries to their heads, each struck five times over the right temple. Francis, too, was found in his bed, his head brutally battered beyond recognition. He lay in his nightclothes, covered entirely by blankets. The attack, marked by four blows to the temple and one to the cheek, was so severe that the steel had penetrated his brain, and there was no sign of a struggle, suggesting that he was asleep when attacked. Boston Globe newspaper writing at the time speculated that the murderer must have been covered in blood and seemingly not washed since the crime. Remarkably, the family was not robbed as their jewelry remained untouched and Mrs. Newton's gold watch was still on her wrist. Both Sarah and Elsie's nightgowns, though, were disturbed and their bodies bore the brunt of the assault. The murder weapon, an axe, was found on the bedroom floor near where the women were slain besides Elsie's bed. The killer had made their escape through a window, leaving the house's doors locked from the inside. An open can of kerosene in a soaked pile of wood indicated an attempted arson, with a lit kerosene lamp thrown at the pile. However, the fire failed to spread, charring only a few sticks without igniting the oil or the hard oak floor. Later, a medical examiner concluded several things. First, death had been instant for all the victims. They had not awakened before their demise. Second, the assailant's attack on the mother and daughter was more ferocious than that against Francis. And third, the axe's blade edge was not used in the attacks. And fourth, there was no evidence of sexual assault. Now, initial police theories centered around robbery as a motive, and a headline in a newspaper declared, killed for $40, suggesting a financial incentive behind the crime. However, this proved to be misleading. Although a small amount of money was taken, as I mentioned earlier, the family's valuables remained untouched. Attention turned immediately to the absence of the farmhand, Paul Mueller. His last known movements came into focus. A neighbor had passed the Newton home around 11.30 p.m. on the fateful night. At the time, the house was completely dark and the man assumed the family was simply asleep. William Eaton saw Mueller near the farm around midnight. George Pike and Arthur Rice also encountered him shortly after that, but Mueller reportedly ignored their greetings. But shortly after this time, several witnesses saw Mueller leaving the farm, heading toward the Brookfield train depot. Other than these interactions, details about Mueller's whereabouts became murky and filled with unconfirmed sightings and speculation about his actions, including an odd focus on his clothing. Some reports suggested that instead of catching a train, Mueller sought refuge and help from strangers. An East Brookfield resident claimed Mueller appeared at his home requesting food and shelter and expressing fear for his life. This account, however, was not corroborated by others and was seemingly disregarded by the police. And it's more plausible that Mueller aimed for the train. The New York Express on the Boston and Albany Railroad departed from the West Brookfield Depot at 1.29 a.m. While it was a six-mile journey by road from the crime scene to the depot, Mueller likely shortened this distance by walking the railroad track rather than the roads, cutting the distance to just four miles. In the initial Boston Globe report, the all-night ticket agent was adamant that no one had purchased a ticket that night, and the yard watchman also didn't recall anyone boarding the train from the station. However, in a later edition of the newspaper, their stories changed. They remembered a short, shabbily dressed man buying a ticket to Springfield, Massachusetts at 1.05 a.m. Then the man had ducked out of sight to wait inconspicuously for the train. The ticket was purchased with an 1836 half-dollar coin, which Arthur Rice, one of the neighbors who found the bodies and had seen Mueller, claimed belonged to Newton. Rice, familiar with Newton's coin collection, was insistent on this point. The story of the coin collection persisted in newspaper reports for years, cited as late as 1902 as a crucial piece of evidence implicating Mueller. But it remains odd that the ticket agent initially failed to recall such a unique transaction with 
a poorly dressed man using an antique coin, but the police pursued this lead to Springfield based on the agent's updated testimony. Arthur Cooley, the brakeman on the Springfield Express night train, noted a small, stout man with long, dark hair behaving suspiciously, both on the Springfield platform and in the smoking car. Cooley described the man's anxious behavior as he frequently laid down and then suddenly sat back up again to scan the car. The man finally disembarked or at least left the smoking car in New Haven, Connecticut. Cooley remembered his attire in detail, noting his dark, rust-colored coat and light-checked cap. The man had no luggage. In New Haven, ticket agent Harold Brotherton also had a belated recollection of a man fitting Mueller's description, selling him a ticket to Bridgeport, Connecticut around 4 a.m. on Saturday, a few hours post-murder. Brotherton specifically noted the man's golf cap with a red thread, a peculiar choice given his otherwise poor attire. A baggage handler named Tracy observed the same short man in the distinctive cap disembarking at New Haven and not reboarding. Tracy found it unusual for someone of the man's appearance to wear a cap typically seen on students. Brotherton remarked on the incongruity of the cap with the man's shabby clothes, finding it singular. Mueller's myriad of brief stops meant that no witness had a prolonged encounter with him, leading to varied and conflicting descriptions of his whereabouts. Police were left to follow a convoluted trail of these reports, trailing Mueller's path station by station, two days behind. Eventually, Mueller's trail disappeared in southern Connecticut, and given that Mueller had received mail from his sister in Patterson, New Jersey, it was speculated he might be heading there for refuge. The distance between New Haven and Patterson spans 85 miles. But on February 13, 1898, Brookfield authorities, losing hope of apprehending Mueller, contemplated raising a $5,000 reward, the sum they hoped would incentivize professional detectives. However, Robert Pinkerton, a renowned detective, expressed skepticism, believing the trail was too cold and Mueller's capture, if ever, a matter of sheer luck. The Brookfield community, while unable to raise the $5,000, did manage to collect $500 as a reward for Mueller's capture. Detectives tracked him across Connecticut and New York, and at one point, they suspected he might have fled to Europe by boat. In a notable incident, Detective Tarbell retrieved a pair of trousers from New Haven, left behind by a man with unconfirmed bloodstains. Unfortunately, a worker from Point of Pines couldn't confirm if these trousers belonged to Mueller, making them the last tangible piece of potential evidence in the case. The disappointing manhunt for Mueller can also be noted for one significant oversight. No one made or published any drawings of his likeness. Many in Brookfield could have provided a description of Mueller, but despite it not being standard police procedure in 1898 to create sketches from witnesses, it had certainly been done before. This missed opportunity could have played a crucial role in the search for Mueller. Newspapers featured line drawings of figures such as Arthur Rice, the last person to see Mueller, and policeman Tarbell, who was in charge of the investigation. There were even line drawings published of items like the kerosene can, but no published drawings of Mueller were ever produced. Today, the Velisca Axe murders are perhaps the most well-known among the 25 family murders likely committed by the man from the train. But this Newton family murder was not underreported at the time. It received as much attention in its day as the Velisca murders did. And across the country, reports of Mueller being spotted in various locations were frequent. And within the first month after the Newton family murder, seven men were arrested under suspicion of being Mueller, ranging from locations as close as Worcester to as far as Nebraska. Over the following year, an additional five were detained. These erroneous arrests continued until 1905, with at least 16 men apprehended because of their resemblance to Mueller. But none of them were Mueller. He successfully fled into the night onto a train re-emerging only a century later as the cases of these family murders were evaluated and tied back to him, the man from the train. Part 4 
So why, absent direct evidence tying Mueller to the Colorado Springs murders and the Velisca Axe murders, do researchers think that Mueller is the man from the train? So let's compare the Newton family murder in Brookfield to the Velisca murders. The murder weapon was the blunt end of an axe. The family was attacked after going to sleep and all victims were hit repeatedly in the head. And afterwards, all victims' heads were covered in cloth. A young girl was sexually exposed after death and the axe was left next to her bed. Valuables were left in plain sight with none stolen, although some cash was taken from the Newtons. All window shades and blinds were completely closed and all doors were locked or jammed shut. Paul Mueller was left-handed. The Velisca murder was also believed to be left-handed, and the final man tried for those murders was left-handed, a fact used against him in his trial. Paul Mueller was very short. The Velisca murder was believed to be short as well. The ceilings on the Moore home were very low, and the axe used in those murders grazed the ceiling several times while dealing the death blows. A taller man could not have swung the axe in the way that it was used in Velisca. And so, the Newton family murders in 1898 through the final ones in 1912 in Velisca and Payson. The man from the train, Paul Mueller, annihilated dozens of families over a 14-year period. So what happened to Mueller after 1912? Well, there are four potential outcomes. One, he died soon after the Payson murders. Two, he lived but stopped killing for some reason. Three, he was arrested and sent to prison for some other crime. Or fourth, he returned to Germany and continued to murder there. Now, walking through these scenarios, it's odd, but number four seems to be the most plausible. Of course, death is unpredictable, and Mueller certainly wasn't an ill or weak man, so an early death seems unlikely. Similarly, it seems highly unlikely that his addiction to killing would have suddenly been sated and that he would have intentionally stopped. He could easily have been arrested for another crime and sent to prison, and this was not a time when criminals were identified with DNA, fingerprints, and photos, and if he were arrested in another state, far from Illinois and Iowa, police would have no ability to tie him to those crimes. And so we come to the fourth explanation for why the man from the train went quiet after 1912. He returned to Germany. And for that story and one final murderous event, you'll have to join me in an upcoming episode of My Dark Path. Thank you for listening to My Dark Path. I'm M.F. Thomas, the creator and host, and I produce this show with our creative director, Dom Purdy. I wrote this episode with some research help from Muhammad Ashraf. Please consider subscribing to My Dark Path on Patreon. For just $5 a month, you'll have access to an exclusive subscriber-only episode every month or so. We already have a back catalog of episodes all about the hidden topics of history, science, and paranormal from the Soviet era. We have just a few more episodes left in that mini-series, including one about the most haunted buildings in Moscow, and another about psychic research at the Moscow Academy of Sciences. Subscribers also get terrific free swag. But even if you can't support us via Patreon, please consider giving My Dark Path a rating wherever you're listening, and feel free to jump over to YouTube and watch our video episodes there. But no matter how you choose to connect with me and My Dark Path, I am grateful for your support. Thanks again for walking the dark paths of history, science, and the paranormal with me. Until next time, good night.